Thank you, everyone. Um, this is obviously not the last time we need to talk these things through. This is really conceived of as you know, a luxurious chance to come together and begin to unpack some of what we face in our everyday, in all of our programs, when we're out there sweating it out, trying to figure out how we're going to get reading instruction to that last kid who happens to be a Guarani speaker but has somehow ended up in a classroom in Costa Rica. <laughs> um, and that's what we're all about. We want every single child to have access to high quality reading instruction and without solving these challenges around language of instruction and how we match the language of instruction to the language of the children, we're not going to succeed in that goal. So we're almost to lunch, which is the happy part. And um, the possibly more happy part is that we're going to do just a few more things before lunch happens. So with the colleagues with whom you are sitting, I would actually like you to take out your handy list of nine topics. These were the nine topics of consideration for the day. We did not get through all of them. And I would like us to attempt something of a speed date with these topics, and I'll explain how that's going to work. The tables that I am pointing to on my left and your right, so the front right over here, the table followed by Carrie Lewis, Sandy's table here in the middle, and uh, Katsuri's table in the middle, I would like you to look at the topics that go from 10 to six. And as you talk about those topics, I would like you to think of the top research questions you can think of for those topics. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Try to talk that over with your tables. The remaining tables, obviously, I would like you to start at the top of your page. Talk quickly through topics 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And try to identify some research topics you think are really important in those areas. You have two minutes. Three, two, one, go. Okay, and three, two, one, done. <laughs> two minutes is very short, but let's see what we've come up with. And I'll go ahead and ask for your patience as I try to say this colleague's name and hope he is still here. Do we have Hara Ruzufinjuho from Madagascar? Yes. Can you tell us a research topic that came to mind and what number it corresponded with for you? Hello, so I'm uh, Hadza Razafnzatu, who used to be a Minister of Fin uh, Education and Finance in Madagascar. Uh, the research topic that we were, uh, I mean, that came out from the two minutes was, uh, um, wouldn't it be better? Well, well, some research shows that um, instead of transitioning from one language to, to another, wouldn't it be better to just stay with both languages or, um, as long as possible, especially the mother languages? And uh, some examples uh, from Asian countries have been uh, uh, mentioned. That was two minutes. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's have additional research on late exit models in our developing country contexts and what those can provide for improved reading outcomes for all of our children. That's a great idea. I'm going to just go on down my list of names. Usma Anzar, what is one research topic that came to mind? Uh, on number eight. <laughs> perhaps uh, research on how much time do teachers require to master a language and then be able to teach it also. Yeah, I think that's really critical. So we hear all the time, oh, the teachers can't teach the language, oh, the teachers can't teach the language. And part of me is incredibly sympathetic and empathetic. And part of me remembers being a Peace Corps volunteer in northeastern Guinea, where there was no speaker of English, French, or Spanish. And let me tell you, <laughs> 
how fast I learned to ask for the bathroom, the potato, <laughs> the well, and the taxi stand. <laughs> Um, teachers have more flexibility than we give them credit for, but on the other hand, we don't want to shortchange them in terms of preparing them for a new task. And I think the only thing that is going to help us find the right middle road is that kind of research. So that's a, that's a grand idea, Usma. Jennifer Swift Morgan, are you in the room? She's getting coffee. She would be getting coffee. Hey, Coley. <laughs> Oh, she's on a call. Um, can you think of one research topic that struck you that might be terribly important as compared to one of these nine areas that we looked at today? Um, I, didn't listen to, um, I didn't listen to the earlier uh, topics that were listed, but I think something that came up that I thought about was um, the colleague who talked about the research in Philippines and how the comprehension levels were so low. I was wondering, are we only looking at EGRA scores or are we looking at other levels of comprehension to do assessments? Um, so looking at that aspect, what, 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 do you, what is comprehension in certain contexts and countries? Okay. So comprehension, how to assess it well, what does it mean and how do we measure whether we have it or don't have it? Exactly, and not just looking at EGRA only. Fantastic, and Jennifer Oji won. Um, Rebecca Westerbrook, do we have somebody of that name here? Can you share with us one thing that came to mind for you? One question we had was whether there is, um, there needs to be more evidence and more evaluation of the success of different transition models. Um, just kind of learning about what has worked in other countries and in other contexts so that, um, you know, other projects and other programs can be built upon the success and the, the lessons learned. Yes, I would say there definitely does need to be, particularly in all the contexts where we're working. Somebody we all know, Julia Frazier. It's your event. What, come to mind, what came to mind? If USAID could fund you now, what would you research? <laughs> oh, do you have all day? <laughs> I have a list. Um, no, one of the things that struck me, um, and I was actually just talking to Joe Kennedy about it, we both come from the TESOL background, from teaching English as a second or foreign language, and we work in that in the US as well as abroad, and thinking about all of the academic background that, um, that exists here in the US, the expertise in how to teach second language learners, and how we could be linking that, um, that community to this community. And Joe and I have both been trying valiantly, but um, getting some more voices around that to link the two communities because we're working on the very same issues. Uh, but I sort of betrayed my table, sorry. <laughs> but I think that's very valid because no matter how hard we try to language map, we're never going, we are so rarely in the ideal case where every child in the room perfectly speaks the language that the teacher perfectly speaks and the books are there in that perfect language and the teacher training has been delivered in that perfect language. And somehow we're not leveraging all of the world knowledge about second language learning and immersion teaching that could serve these children of the kinds I just described who are Guarani speakers but somehow going to school in Costa Rica. <laughs> um, that's, that's a language and evidence base and a linguistic base and a research base we need to draw on more. Um, Charles Gale, do I have a Charles Gale? He was here, but I He was here, so he gets a temporary pass. Jessica Mejia, what struck you as a highly trained researcher? talked about what we talked about in the two minutes, but um, I think one of the things that is always difficult for me is sort of the, the crossroad of the research that we know, mother tongue, learning in your language, all of that stuff, and the implementation of the reality in the classroom or the country and the constraints that they are under, so. Right, and I think something that the um, community would benefit from is having a longer working session like this where we can come up with some things like some decision trees or you know stories of what people have done when they have hit a certain roadblock because the roadblocks are many and we all know what the idea you know we know what the Wizard of Oz pearly gates look like that we're trying to get to but we don't know what the yellow brick road always is and it often seems to be missing some bricks um, so it might be worth talking more about that, so that's great. What about Lawrence Goldman? Mm -hmm. 
we don't have a Lawrence Goldman. <laughs> Carol, <laughs> have you been have you been losing participants? Okay. <laughs> um, two more. And M Baker, somebody Baker. No, already gone. And then one person I know who is here and who would be probably the best situated to give us a good hard-hitting research topic to take home and think hard about. Dr. Sandy Ojukutu, what do you want us to research? This is one we put up on the board, and I noticed someone else put it up, so it was much more eloquent on the board, but here goes. Uh, the teachers are the critical element. We can put in all the books, we can put in all the blackboards, uh, we can do our cascade training, but if the teachers can't really teach, we have a problem. It doesn't matter what we put in the classroom. So how to remediate that? Who's bold enough to say that in our projects, we will begin by testing the teachers? Are they fluent in reading at the primary six level, both in the mother tongue they'll be instructing and in the transition language? And if not, and most likely not, how do we support them? Not for a, a training or two, but for two, three, four, five years. Is USAID willing to change its design and say, we'll test our teachers, and then maybe for the first year, we'll actually train them and then support tr uh, training throughout. If we don't address the fact that our teachers can't read uh, in the languages we're asking them to do instruction, then we're never going to solve that particular problem. And we're only right now, at USAID, after six years of implementation, bringing that up as a point of discussion. And the frightening reactions we give ourselves when we say, so how do we build that into a design? What do we do? How much money is that going to eat? Oh, dear, is that really where we want to put our money? Uh, I don't know all the answers, but the key question is, should we, teach te should, we tr should we measure teachers in their ability in the mother tongue and the transition language? And then what do we do with those results? Yeah, those are really important for all kinds of reasons, not just fiduciary. So um, thank you for all of those ideas. They complement the ideas that are on the board. I think, Julia, your intention is to take all of this and somehow have a workshop readout for everybody who's been here today. Um, everybody knows that I was put on the program for closing remarks, so I'm going to do my best, although my instincts are to say, okay, we're done, we're closed. <laughs> um, but I do think that our presence here this morning is representative of a joint commitment. I mean, we are, and this is a new world for all of us. I didn't begin in development in this world, but we are a community that is committed to teaching children to read in languages they speak and understand whenever and wherever that is possible. There may be times when it isn't, but most of the time you can find at least part of the road toward that. And yet we're a community confronted by all of these common challenges that have been evoked. Um, planning for reading instruction in multilingual contexts, doing all those curricula, the scopes and sequences, um, figuring out all these mismatches, as we've called them, or disconnects between student language ability, teacher language ability, um, the language policy and country may not be favorable to what you're looking to do. These are all things that we live day to day to day. And the only response we've had so far that has seemed to move this topic along a bit is to really run hard after the data. I want to underscore again the incredible work done in the Ghana uh, FHI 360 presentation. Being able to have maps like this, I know this, I've experienced it with ministries, being able to go into a ministry and say, I have a map of every single one of your schools. It's a census, not a sample. And I can tell you which ones are homogeneous in terms of student language makeup and which ones are heterogeneous and which ones we never knew existed but seem to speak a language from two countries over. <laughs> is really useful data, and it is how this discussion starts on the ground. So if USAID is not giving you money to do this, make us. Tell us. You are the technical experts. Say to us, we cannot do good reading work without this data, because you cannot. It's not possible. Um, so that's something on which we all agree. And then where things get interesting is all the innovation that we've all found to work around the various challenges. So if I have a language policy that only lets me teach in five languages, then I have child who speaks in language number seven, I figure out a way for the community to tutor him, or I find a way to talk with the ministry about putting in a teacher who speaks both of those languages who can back up that child. But it's at that very local 
individual level that we're solving these problems. And that's hard in these big USAID programs, but we have to know how to do it. And the more we can learn from each other's innovations in those ways, the better we'll get at doing this work. Um, I want to go back to Julia's point. I think something going forward that we can do a lot more, we can allow ourselves to do now that we have a more or less joint commitment to teaching in languages children speak and understand, we can allow ourselves to look at immersion teaching models. We can allow ourselves to look at second language learning models because that's what helps that child who speaks language number seven when everyone else is speaking language number five. And we have to be able to teach our, ch our teachers how to work with that child using those models that are about second language learning and second reading learning. So themes that continue to challenge us going forward, how do we collect the best data on language mapping and share it with partner institutions? This should become as typical as you know, cold supply chains for the health sector. This should not be innovative. This should not be out of the box. It should just be something we do. How do we make sure we have the tools on the tablets, the simple methodologies, you know, the validated ways of going about this that will actually allow us to do this? What choices are available to us when working in languages where there is no codified orthography? Paul, where are you? <laughs> Your choice is to email Paul <laughs> about, <laughs> about the non-codified orthography for the language in question um, because that's something we could solve if we committed to solving it. Languages have been codified before, and the ones that aren't could be, but we'd have to agree that they need to be. Um, and I'm thinking of the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, where I was just talking with somebody who said, well, we can't do anything about the fact that the children speak three uncodified languages. We have to teach them in Spanish. I'm sure that'll go well. Those kids will really rock those exams in Nicaragua. Um, what do we do in the multilingual classrooms? So Rachel had a really fascinating presentation here about how you start to break down what can bridge and what can't bridge from one language to another. And that was followed by Carol's reflections on making children aware at a metalinguistic level of what they're doing. And we all know it, and Sandy's nodding her head, kids are smart. If you say to a child, oh, in uh, English, we call this thing a table, and Usma, in Urdu, we call this thing a? Okay. <laughs> That's not actually a very hard concept for a child to grasp. Now, they may forget that Urdu word. You might have to supply that again and again and again, but they can think about that, oh, there are two language systems, and I say it one way in one language and one way in another. We can teach them that kind of metalinguistic thinking, and it can help them in those multilingual or bilingual systems where we're supposed to be teaching them in three languages at a time, although I'd rather leave that up to Rachel and her team than try it myself. <laughs> um, and then there's the teacher question. How do we make sure that teachers are comfortable without patronizing them? Teachers are not dumb. It will not take them three years to learn to transcribe a national language. <laughs> we need to give them the extra training support so that they know how they're going to write things in Sonrai or Malinke or Hausa, but we don't need to assume that our programs will be continually torpedoed for five years because they can't get those skills. They can. So it's finding that middle line with our teachers and supporting them while not assuming they will never be able to do it. Uh, and then the larger questions for a community of practice. How do we capture our joint experiences? Does this forum suffice or do we need a follow-up? And I would leave that to Jennifer and Julia and the people who uh, called us together today. And then how do we go ahead with these research topics that you brought up for us and actually start funding this, publishing it, and sharing it out in the community. I think we're called upon both on the donor side and the implementing partner side to do that because these questions aren't going away and because we need answers we agree upon and can go back to and can teach those who come after us to go back to because much as I would like to believe this is all going to be solved in the next three or four years, I think we're going to be working on it for quite a long time. So let's think of this as a beginning. And let's hope that Jennifer and Julia and all of our colleagues will reach out to us for the follow-up steps. 
and um, keep these good ideas in mind and look for the report and the readout and uh, head off to lunch. Thanks, everybody. Um, huge thank you to Rebecca for finding a way to pull these millions of ideas. I don't know how, there's a, probably a couple hundred questions on the wall right now. And, and she brought it together for us. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, thank you also to our panelists who were simply stunning. Each presentation was just, could have been a day or more on its own. So thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, and thanks also to the table facilitators. Um, some were not panelists and were very gracious to step in and, and facilitate a table um, just about on the fly. So thank you to all of them as well. Um, and thank you also to all of my FHI 360 colleagues. We have a ton of us in here and a ton who are not here, but we're behind the scenes helping to make this day go very smoothly. So I'd like to also recognize all of them. Um, I know that Jennifer Gerst and I will be in conversation thinking about what are the next steps coming out of today. Today was really exciting, at least for me. Um, hopefully for others as well. And one thing I'd like to say though is, we, we, it's iterative. We can look at language in education as a topic of its own and we need to keep this conversation going. But at the same time, the Global Reading Network has working groups and materials, working groups in use. We're, language is in everything, everything we do. Um, we're doing it with some kind of language and this is something that needs to, be on top of our consciousness as we're entering into all of our different aspects of programming. Uh, who's going to understand this? How are they going to understand it? If it's a policy discussion with the ministry, where are we bringing in language? Where are we making sure this, what the ministry is saying from the capital is ground truth in a community? When we're talking about education in emergencies, are we talking about the language that we're going to be using to provide services and support to communities? So from like every aspect, we have to be asking about language in everything. So it's iterative. Um, and please do carry that with you as you go on in your area of specialization uh, so that we can see this feed in kind of in a, in a multiplying exponential way. So thank you all very much. I won't take you any longer to get your lunch. There's lunch right out here. Um, please do keep letting people in social media know that we had this great event. And a huge thanks also to all of the people on the webcast who have stuck with us for three hours on the computer. Being a remote worker myself, I know that that's some endurance. So thanks to everybody.